Cross Point Church. How are y'all doing? If you may have noticed, uh, oh, there's a few people wearing these shirts around. Uh, we had a big weekend this weekend, but first, before I mention anything about that, can we just give the Lord a hand this morning? How good is God? Man, that, that song, Break Every Chain, it was just, just reminding me of, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional because it's so beautiful. But that one day we're going to be singing in heaven with God and we're going to say he broke every chain. He broke every chain. He has freed us. He has redeemed us. And we get to stand before him for all eternity, singing those praises over and over. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Almighty. And so that just reminded me of a picture of what heaven will look like one day. And so I wanted to, to tell you guys about this weekend. Didn't mean to get emotional, but man, it was just, it was good. We had a weekend this weekend. Uh, anybody ever heard of Disciple Now? May have heard of that. So this weekend, we did that, but we called it The Weekend. And uh, we just shortened the name, took out a few vowels, made it cool, you know, uh, trendy, uh, contextualized a little bit, got some tie-dye t-shirts, things like that. Um, but we had an awesome two days. Uh, this past week was filled with volunteers serving starting on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we had students show up Friday. Um, we had all day serving yesterday, as you saw in some of the videos. Um, we had small groups. We had, uh, we had food all weekend. We had parents provide and also cook food all weekend. Um, we had all kind of things going on, just seeing God's people come together uh, to, to encourage, to equip, and to send out our, our young generation of middle school and high school students. And so this weekend, we had over 100 students uh, at, our, at our weekend, and we can praise God for that, especially after this year. We had over 100 students. We had around 30 young adults, college, Air Force guys, young adults, teachers that served and spent a lot of time with students, poured into them, spent time in small groups with them, sweated as they went and did different activities yesterday and serving all around our community. And we had probably 20 or 30 parents as well just sacrifice their time. And so I want to give it up to them real quick, if y'all don't mind. And then we also had uh, most of the people up here that were part of the worship team. They were, most of them were here the last two nights too. And so we've all pulled a long weekend this weekend. And, and this morning we were so excited to be with you guys. And so... We had an amazing weekend. Uh, it was great seeing God move. Um, we had several students respond in different ways. We had one student for sure say, I'm tired of running. I want to give my life to the Lord tonight. And so we praise God for that last night. And so this morning, uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave was like, hey, you good to preach on that Sunday morning since Dina? I was like, yeah, that'll be fine. And then like last night about 10, at 10 p.m. when we got home, I was like, what was I thinking? And so I preached Friday night to our students. Uh, Pastor David, thank goodness, he preached last night to our students and brought the word. And so last night I was working on my message for this morning. And I, I actually had been working on it all week, don't worry. I've been looking at it all week. <laughs> but I finally was like, had everything passed, and I was like, all right, let's really dig in. Let's just see what the Lord has to say. And as I was working on it, it was about, uh, I won't tell you what time it was, but I was sitting there and all of a sudden I just, I just felt this urge, this this feeling that I need, to, I need to go back to our message from Friday as well. The message I share with our students Friday. And so I'm going to do something really crazy this morning. I'm going to preach two sermons. You all right with that? If you love Jesus and you love his word, you better be all right with that. Amen? If you don't know Jesus, you're going to find out how you can love it in just a minute, all right? And so I just want to get into this real quick. I want to pray for us because I'm going to try to go through this. I got two messages for you, all right? So go, go ahead and get your notes ready, get your, get your Bible ready, because I'm going to have you flipping a few times. But I'm going to give you the word this morning that God has placed on my heart to share with you guys. So let's pray together. Father, we're humbled to stand before you. We're humbled to call you our Father, our Creator, our Lord, our Savior. And so Father, as we continue in worship through the reading of your word, through listening to what you have to say to us, Father, that we can find freedom in you tonight, or this morning, that we can find freedom in your word, we can find freedom and hope in Jesus, that we can be molded, we can be shaped, we can be transformed by your gospel, and that we can be sent out of here as your people to be your representatives, to be your ambassadors to the world around us. So Father, those next few minutes, let my words be clear. Let my thoughts be only on you and your word. 
Let our hearts be open and tuned into what you have for us this morning. We love you and praise you. Amen. So our theme for this weekend, our theme was truly free. How can we find freedom in Jesus was a simple question. And the reason I asked that is because anybody awake this past year? Anybody have a great year, an amazing year? We had some things happen this past year. And this past year, a lot of us felt a little different than we did in years past. We, we felt a little more fear. Anybody say amen to that? We felt a little more anxiety. We felt a little more pressure. Anybody confused at any time this past year? What's going on in this world? What's happening? God, where are you at? We found helplessness. We found some anxiety. We found some worry. And all these questions, I think, for me, I don't know about you, but it, it revealed a lot of insecurities in my life. And I think the biggest one was that I'm not in control. You're not in control. We're not in control. And so when we feel like we have no control, our hands feel like they're tied behind our back, right? We feel like we, we don't know what to do. What am I supposed to be doing? Why, why am I here? What is my purpose? But what if I told you you don't have to be bound by that? What if I told you this morning that no matter what happens past year, there is freedom. And no matter what's happening, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter our circumstances, what we talked to our students this weekend and what I felt like God told me to tell you all this morning is we can be truly free in Jesus. We can be unbound. We can have all those chains broken. We can be free to rest. We can be free to have hope. We can be free to live. We can be free to be who God intended for us to be. And so as believers in Jesus, the, the marks of success in our world and, and what the world tells us we need to be, we don't have to measure up to that. The fear, that anxiety we felt this past year in our jobs, in our homes, in our lives, they don't have to control us. That worry, that frustration over the sin that God exposed in our lives this past year, this past week, this past day, it doesn't have to cripple us. When we find Jesus, when we experience Jesus, when we trust in Jesus, we can be truly free. We can be truly free. And so I want to look at our passage for the weekend. Whenever you see our students, you can look at the back of their shirt, and it's got our passage for the weekend on there. And it's going to be John 8, 31 through 32. And so we're going to look at John 8, 31 through 32, and then later we're going to jump to the book of Acts, all right? And so John 8, 31 through 32, I just want to, I cut all the meat, I cut off a lot of fat from my message Friday night, so I'm going to give you an abbreviated message from Friday night, but I just felt like God was calling me to just share this with you guys, because I know there's people in this room who need this freedom that only Christ can offer. And so let's look at John 8, 31 through 32. I still got, band kind of went quick, so I got plenty of time this morning. So, so John 8, 31 through 32 says this. So, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we'll be reading that a couple more times in the next few minutes. But just to set up before I jump into my observations from this text, the people Jesus is talking to is the Jews, right? He said to the Jews who believed. He had just been at this festival that was a big Jewish celebration, and Jesus came up, and he came to this, fe this festival. It was the fe Feast of Booths. They basically made a bunch of tents and remembering what God had done for them when they were going to the promised land. And so they're looking back on this faithfulness of God. And, and in the midst of that, Jesus is there. And he starts preaching and teaching. And he's saying, you remember how God promised you salvation? You're setting up these little tents to remember that you had to sojourn and live among the land for years and years, waiting for God to fulfill his promises. And he did. But he's saying, I am the one who's here to fulfill that promise. And so as he preached... He's going around to these Jews who, who were looking for the Messiah, and some of them start saying, wait, is this God the Christ? Is this the Messiah? But then some of them were like, oh, this guy's a lunatic. He's crazy. We've got to get him out of here. And so the, the tension is real in this moment. There's people who absolutely disagree with what he says, but then there's some people that say, wow, this, 
this guy's preaching the word like I've never heard before. He's speaking God's words right now and it's transforming and piercing our hearts. And so that's who he's talking to. He says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed. And so how can we know Jesus this morning? How can we be truly free? I got three things for you real quick. First thing is to know Jesus is to follow him. To know Jesus is to follow him. That first verse, the verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And so Jesus implies this if-then statement. If you do this one thing, then it will show that you did this other. If you satisfy this condition, there's going to be an outcome of that, right? An if-then statement. And here he's telling the people, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. And so that condition, if you abide in Jesus then you will know Jesus, right? And so abide, that word means to stay, to remain. It is a picture of sticking with something and not leaving it. And this is the type of relationship Jesus was calling them to. He said if you abide in him, if you rest in him, you stay committed to him, then you you will know me. You will be my disciple. You will know who I am. And so when he says you must abide in his word, for these Jews, it was literally the words he was speaking to them, right? Literally the voice of God right there speaking to them. But for us, when we look at this, it's, it's the Bible. It's the whole thing. What he spoke to us, and now we're on this side of history where we get to see all that God said for us, all that God says for us in this Bible. And this is how we can know Jesus. And so that point was to, to know Jesus is to follow him. And when we follow him, when we spend time in his word, We have that opportunity to know and have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Such a magnificent concept, right? Yet so simple. So simple. And so this word abide, you know him. But hear me with this before we move on. You cannot know Jesus separate from his word. You cannot know Jesus separate from his teaching. You cannot know Jesus separate from knowing what he did. You can't know him without knowing that he died in our, in our place. But unfortunately, though, as we look around our Christian world, it seems that many people may not really know what all Jesus did. They know Jesus, or at least they know a little bit of Jesus. But study after study shows that one in five Christians, the people that claim to be a believer in Christ, throughout the week, they don't open their Bible one time. They leave Sunday, they get here the next Sunday, and that ribbon is still in the same place as it was last week. Maybe they don't even bring their Bible. And so that's not an indictment on all of us, but if we want to know Jesus, how did he give us to know him? His word, right? Pretty, pretty simple then, there. But then another thing was less than one in five, so on the opposite end of the scale, less than one in five read their Bible every day, have a relationship with him every single day. And so my challenge for you in this moment is where do you fall on this line? Now just reading the word, is that what saves you? No, but when you read the word, you know what it does? It points you to the one that you can find freedom and rest in. It points you to our Savior. And so don't feel it as an indictment on you, but it's a challenge to get to know our Savior better. And so the next thing is to know Jesus is to know that truth. To know Jesus is to know the truth. And it says in verse 32, and you will know the truth. He doesn't say a truth. He doesn't say some truth. He says the truth, the absolute unshakable truth. Later on in John, he says a famous line when Thomas asked him, well, Jesus, if you're going to leave us, how, how will we know the way? And he responds, he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so he continues to give them this truth. And at cross point, man, we believe that the Bible is inspired, right? We believe it's God's word. We believe it's inerrant. There's no, there's no errors. It's sufficient. It's necessary to know Jesus. And it gives us the truth And it gives us and tells us who God is and why he created us, what he created us for. But on the other side of that, the world around us. It tells us 
there's no absolute truth claims. Whatever I want to do is good. This idea that there's a definite universal set of truths just seems unimaginable to so many. They're bound by their own thoughts because they want to live only for themselves. But they don't understand and look and see that God created all things. All things are held together by him. And that we can find truth in him. And I believe this belief has infiltrated every part of our society too. It creeps in on me. It creeps in on you. In our families, in our homes. Because the easy road is the road that follows the world. The road that follows men. This is what my heart feels like is best. So I'm going to follow it. And I think that's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. That leads to life. And those who find it, unfortunately, are few. And so we must know the truth. We must know Jesus and know the truth. And the final thing here is to know Jesus is to be set free. It's to be set free. Anybody need a little freedom in their life? You might need some chains broken in here. And the truth will set you free. So simple. But here's the thing. Truth statements. Are all true statements great statements? Not all true statements are great statements. One of the most heartbreaking truths I had in high school was, hey man, we loved your effort, but uh, you're just not cut out for our team. Anybody ever feel that? Man, it, that hurt. Maybe another one. Uh, it's not you, but it's me. <laughs> or it's not me, it's you. Whatever it is. Maybe we should just be friends. That one hurts, doesn't it? You know what they really mean. I don't like you. And that was just the truth, right? They're just telling you the truth. Maybe veiled a bit. But then there's other truths that we get hit with. I'm sorry. But there's nothing we can do to stop this disease, to stop this cancer, to stop this accident. And so we encounter truths like that every day that are anything but freedom, right? Those are the truths that weigh us down, that hurt the most, that knock us off our feet. But what I want to encourage you with is that Jesus offers us not that kind of truth, but a different truth. The kind of truth he offers is one that helps us continue walking after those hard truths. The kind of truth that he takes the burden we just experienced and he lifts it off of us. It's the kind of truth that never changes, is always for us, is is always on our side. And I want to tell you what the truth is. That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus came to take away our sins. That Jesus died on the cross, he resurrected, he lived a life that we should have and died a death that we deserved. And then he resurrected to give us freedom, to give us life. And that's the truth that frees us. That's the truth that we can find freedom in, the truth that doesn't change, that doesn't hold us back. And that's the truth I want you to discover this morning, is that Jesus truly sets us free. He sets us free from that sin. He sets us free from the pressure, from our jobs, from our families, from our world, from scrolling that social media he sets us free from all those pressures so that everything we do can lead to glorify him so we can live who he's called us to be and rest in him no matter the circumstances that happen because this world is messed up this world is broken this world is in need of redemption and it's not God's fault it's our fault for all that right it was our fault that sin entered the world that we stand separated from God but the truth is in Christ He made a way that we can have redemption. We can have reconciliation to our Father. And so although he doesn't always make our problems go away, he doesn't always fix our problems like we want him to. Amen? We want them things fixed, and we're like, God, where you at? But that's why we know his truth, because he still provides us with the assurance. He provides us with the promise that in him there is no problem that can overcome us and separate us from him that's the mindset perspective we need to change no matter our circumstances no matter what happens we still have Jesus 
And that allows us to get through anything. We're still going to be hurt. We're still going to find problems. We're still going to be burdened. But he lightens that load when we put our faith in him. He says, if you abide in my word, you will know that truth and that truth will set you free. And so knowing Jesus is true freedom. In sermon one. So now what? Now what do we do? What do we do with that newfound freedom? What do I do now? How do I, what, what changes in my life? Well, over the last month or so, we've been walking through a sermon series here at Cross Point called Life on Mission. You've probably heard that phrase over and over again in life, right? We've got to live lives on mission. And so we've talked about how the gospel, how God makes dry bones live. Y'all remember that? God makes those dry bones live. We talked about how we must realign ourselves with God's kingdom. After he makes us alive through Christ, we realign our lives to follow and seek God's kingdom. And then we also talked about biblical community last week. The importance of being molded, being shaped, being loved and encouraged. Being pointed to Jesus. Having those people around us that, man, when we're going through it, they're right there holding our hands, pointing us to Jesus. That's why all throughout the New Testament, as this church is being built, the church of Jesus Christ is coming together, it's morphing, it's being birthed. You see community all throughout. They broke bread together in their homes. They shared things, their love, their care, their lives. And so all these things we talked about the last few weeks, all of them happen so that we can complete the mission that God gave us. Anybody know where we can find that mission? Matthew 28, right? Make disciples of all nations. He said, when we know the truth, now we're to go tell others that truth. Because this truth is so important, it set us free. There's people in this room that still need to be set free. There's people that you work with that still need to be set free. There's people in your family that still need to be set free. There's, there's coworkers, there's bag boys, there's anything and everyone. There's people all around us that need freedom from their sin, from the chains that hold them down. And God tells us we have the words that give life. And those words are God's words. And so if you want to flip over to Acts 17. Acts 17, what I want to look at is, is a, a picture of what Paul does. He has this truth if, you know, if you're familiar with Paul, man, Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He was, he was, his main focus at a time was to, to, to go and find Christians and, and get them to stop being Christians. He would throw them in jail. He had some even stoned to death. But then in the, in the heat of the moment when he's going to find even more Christians to throw them in jail, to try to stop what Jesus is doing, Jesus confronts him with a blinding light and a voice that says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, I, I, I don't even really know you, Jesus. But in that moment, he understood that the body of Christ, all of us, Jesus suffered, and he also told us we're gonna suffer, unfortunately, right? But that's because the world hates the message of the gospel. But even though it hates the message of the gospel, does that make us shy away from it? No, <laughs> it should give us more courage to go out because people need to hear that freedom is it can be found and so Acts 17 I want to look here for just a minute and this passage is a passage of Paul giving us an example of how we're to share our faith with those around us anybody in here ever feel like I don't know how to share my faith anybody you can be honest I feel that way sometimes I have an amazing opportunity I'm like I don't really know what to say right now right or, man, I, I really want to go get some lunch real quick, but, I, I, you know, and we have all these excuses we make, but, but Paul, he gives us an example of just, just some ways to think about how to share our faith, how we can be everyday missionaries. Because we send missionaries all across the world, but everyone in here that's a believer in Christ, you also have a mission, so therefore you're a missionary, all right? You have a mission field. You have a place that you go to share this truth of freedom with people around you. 
And so I'm going to read this lengthy passage, and it's a little long, but hang with me. It's the Word of God. It's where we can find true freedom. But a few things from Acts real quick is there's passages all through Acts that some are really descriptive of what was going on at the birth of the church. Immediately after Jesus came, he died on the cross, he rose again, he sends them out to Judea, Samaria, all the earth to share the message of the gospel. And the church that we see today is being birthed, that, that church that follows after Christ is, is kind of being born. And so there's a lot of things in Acts, man, it's wild. Anybody ever read all the way through Acts? It gets wild in some places. And so there's some things that just describe how this spirit was moving in such mighty and crazy ways that were pointing people to Jesus. And so a lot of them describe, but there's not all of them are prescriptive, saying we need to do this today. And so the passage today, though, is really cool. It's a little bit of both. It describes what Paul is doing, how he is sharing his faith, but it also is prescribed as a prescription for how we should probably share our faith. You follow me? And so I want to look at this passage. It's a little lengthy, and then I'm just going to just give you three points to observe, all right? Three points to think about of how we can be everyday missionaries. Because this morning, if you're not a believer, I pray that Jesus, you can find freedom in him. That's how I, like, I preach that first message. Second message is, if you are a believer or you just became a believer, now this is what you got to go do, all right? So I'm giving all to you this morning. And we still got plenty of time. So how can we be everyday missionaries? Let's read what Paul does. Now Paul, verse, uh, sorry, I, I don't think I gave you the verse. Acts 17, verse 16. Acts 17, verse 16. We're going to read through 27. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, We may know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Sounds like our world today, right? We just want to know so, the next new thing, the next big thing. Verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, that therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. He continues on, but we're going to stop there for now. And so how can we be everyday missionaries? Just a couple takeaways from what Paul said. The first thing you see him is, was he doing a little observation? Yeah, he was observing his world. Observing his world. To be an everyday missionary, to know how to share the gospel with others, first off, you need to observe your world. You need to know where you're at. He starts off, he's waiting for his boys, right? He's waiting for his uh, other, other brothers in Christ to get there. But while he's waiting in Athens, he starts observing everything that's going on. And for the same thing with us, we must know the people around us. We must understand the people we live with, the people we work with, the people that we go to the store and see at the store with. We need to know everyone around us, not their names, but we need to understand what makes them drive. We must understand their hurts. We need to understand their problems. We need to understand their injustices they feel in their lives. We need to understand their issues. 
We must observe how people live and interact with one another. And we do this so that we can better love them and point them to Jesus. Because you can't really go give a message to somebody and not really speak to where they're at, right? And so Paul's example here, he shows this observation. He's waiting for his friends. He goes to the synagogues, it says. He goes to the Jews. He goes to the marketplaces. He goes into the community. He begins reasoning with people there. He begins having conversations with people there. He starts asking questions about their lives. And so he starts just observing everything. He starts being in the culture. He starts loving people. He's, he's where the people that need Jesus most are. This past summer, I think I shared another message, but I read a biography this summer by, by a retired Navy SEAL, and one of the things that stood out to me in one of the chapters that when I read it, I was like, man, this is what we should be doing as believers. But it's one thing that he learned in training, and I think it's kind of a sniper technique, um, but it's called SEALS, S-L-L-S. If you're in the military, you may can make, help me figure this more out later, but I think I, think I got a good grasp on and and I want to use it for what we're going to do. But it, the, that, that acronym stands for Stop, Look, Listen, Smell. The idea is that when you put your boots on the ground, you're in enemy territory. You got to stop. You don't need to go run and do anything first. You need to stop. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to look around. You need to observe a little bit. You need to listen to your surroundings. And finally, that last S is, is smell your environment. It's kind of silly, but Think about those who are going to war, who are going across and, and in the enemy territory. They need to know everything about what's going on so they can be prepared for anything that's to come. And so this practice is not very groundbreaking, right? You probably innately do this everywhere you go, right? You walk into a store, you're like, what's that smell, right? You walk into a store and you observe, man, they need to keep this place up a little better. You know, you, you're doing all these things already. You stop what you're doing, try to figure out what, what aisle you need to go to. But as Paul, he enters Rome here, it almost appears that this is what he was doing, right? Because he walks in, he's observing all that's going on, but it wasn't just a casual observation, it's an intentional observation. He's looking around to figure out, how can I best bring these people the truth? He doesn't just walk in, guns blazing. He walks in, he starts observing. He starts understanding the people. One, because he loves them. And he wants to see them come to know Jesus. And so he stopped. It says he was walking around, but he stood still. He looked around. He saw places of idol worship, probably. He listened to people praying to false gods. He heard people talking about philosophy and, and all these false beliefs. He probably even smelled incense in the air as people were sacrificing to false gods on these altars. And so what his observations turned up was that there were people all around him who needed the truth. They desperately needed Jesus and the rest and the truth that freedom brings. And it says Paul's spirit was provoked. He was torn. He was broken. Because he immediately felt a love and a compassion for those around him. And he wanted to best reach them for the gospel. And so the second observation or the second thing I want to see is we have to know our platform. As believers, we have to know our platform. So Paul, it says he's standing in the Areopagus. They brought him to the Areopagus too. And if you're familiar with this time, this is what, one of the largest literal platforms you could have in this culture. They're in Athens. They're in the place of the intellectuals, right? The place where everybody was educated. Everybody there, if they were Educated, if they had degrees back then, they'd probably have about 17 little degrees after their name, right? Today we got doctor, PhD, but they were like probably about 12 of those after. They thought they were, they knew it all. They thought they were the cream of the crop. And so for Paul, he's invited to this place because they're like, wait, this is new. And remember Luke describing this scene says, these people just wanted something new. One, one, once one thing went out of fad, they moved on to the next. And so Paul was the new fad for them. But Paul knew his platform, right? He knew that, you know what? There's going to be people who need the gospel, and I'm going to use this opportunity for his glory. And so we have to know the places that we're at. We have to be intentional with where we're at. And Paul probably used those observations earlier to make his way to this place. 
Obviously, the Lord opened up this pathway for him to be at the, the greatest place possible to share his faith with those who kind of ran the society. He trusted God, but he also had to do a little work as well. He, he had to spend time in the marketplace, spent time in the community loving and listening to people. And so maybe you say, well, I'm a nobody, right? I don't know that much about my faith. I've made too many mistakes lately. I don't want to even have a platform. Well, let me just, just burst your bubble. Every one of you have a platform. It may be small, it may be big, maybe medium size. But you all, everybody in here knows somebody, right? We all know somebody. We know a lot of somebodies, right? And every one of them needs the truth of the gospel. So what about our coworkers, our neighbors, our employees? What about your children? If your platform is only in the home, man, God's called you to cultivate that platform and, and use it for his glory. And so are you using that platform? Do you even recognize the platform you have? The one that God strategically placed you at? Because every one of us in here, when we walk out of this door today, some of us may go to the same home, some of us may go to the same restaurants, but tomorrow we're probably all going to go to a little bit different place. Your kids may go to school. You're going to go to your job. Your husband, your wife's going to go to their job. Everybody in here is going to go to a different place, and they have a different platform. They have a different place that they're called to be missionaries to point people to the freedom in Christ. But the last thing I want to see is what should we actually do with this platform? And I believe it's pretty simple. Paul says to proclaim that truth. A quote that's been pretty popular for some time it says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. While this sentiment may be somewhat true, I want to go ahead and tell you don't live that way. Because like we established in the first message this morning, the only way to know the truth, the only way for people to be set free is to hear the word of God, to hear the words of life, to hear that Jesus came to save them. So you got to live it out yeah, that first part, man, preach the gospel at all times. But it is necessary to use words as well. Now, it may be sometime, you don't have to just walk into a conversation and be like, hey, do you know Jesus? Sometimes that works. But sometimes you've got to love them, care for them, understand them, know who they are, observe their culture, observe their problems, observe their issues, and then you say, you know what? I know a way for you to find freedom. I know a way to you to find rest. And then we give them Jesus. And so look at what Paul said here. When he opens up and starts teaching in the Areopagus, he says, men of Athens. These were literally the men of Athens. That was like their title, right? That was who they were proud to be. They felt, they felt like they were the, the, the top of the, 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 I can't even think. I'm just going a little crazy. But they're, they're the best of the best, men of Athens. They are proud to be called that. And so in that small statement, he's automatically loving them and, and lifting them up, right? He's saying, men of Athens. He looks directly at them. But here's the thing, he looks them in the eye and over the next few verses he proclaims the truth by meeting them where they are but then he leads them to where they need to go. He meets them where they are so that he can lead them where they need to go. And so he starts off, he says, men of Athens, he says, I observe that you're very religious. And like I said, he, he go ahead and he kind of lifts them up, right? They're like, oh yeah, we, we are pretty religious around here, right? We have about 50 gods. That's we're looking for some more. Can you tell us about yours? So for them, this is kind of a status, a notch on their belt. Charles Swindle said this about him. He said, he met them in familiar territory so that he could take them to unfamiliar territory. He met them where they knew the most. They were, they were religious as all religious can be, but they didn't know Jesus, and he was about to take them there. And then he talks about one of their gods. He says, this unknown God, let me tell you who that unknown God is. You recognize that there's this God that, that's still out there, and let me tell you who he is. And then later on, he finishes his message, and I'm going to read Acts 17, 30 through 34. And this is how he finishes this message. He goes on, it's kind of lengthy, that's why I was like, I had to cut off a lot today. Go back and study this message a little more. It's one of Paul's greatest messages there. 
But Acts 17, 30 through 34, this is how he ends this message that he's given to these people, standing in the most high of all places you can stand in Athens. He says, the times of ignorance, God overlooked those. Saying, in your sin, in your brokenness, God overlooks that through Jesus here. He says, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. That is Jesus. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And he says in verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. They were intrigued. But then immediately Paul went out from their midst. Some men joined him and believed. And then he talks about a couple of those were Dionysus and a woman named Damaris and then others with them. And so he ends this message with two nasty words for these people. The first one, repentance. How many of y'all like repentance? Saying, you know what, I'm a sinner, right? I have wronged the God of the universe. I am dead in my sin. That's so much fun to say, right? But earlier, it's a truth claim that we have to say. It's a truth claim that we have to understand and recognize because when we understand that, the next nasty R word is resurrection. When we understand our standing before the God of the universe and we put our trust and our faith in Jesus, the one who frees us, the one who resurrect from the grave, we can find resurrection in him. We can find new life in him. And so that's the truth that we have to proclaim. And here's the thing is everyday missionaries, every one of you guys are everyday missionaries. We're called to go do this everywhere we go. We're called to be faithful at proclaiming this truth. But we don't do the saving, only God does. So Paul, did he stay and try to convince more of them? He kind of just was like, peace out. Come on if you want to come. Now, there's people in your life, man, you got to work on and work on and work on, and you're going to keep working on and working on, right? But for Paul, he was in a place where God's calling in his life was to preach the gospel and go and plant churches. And so there were still some people that stayed back and started cultivating those relationships and started continuing to plant the gospel in those people. Sometimes that's us. We're the ones that are called to plant the gospel and to continue cultivating it, right? Earlier, at the, the picture that we put on there, the video, I was watching it, JT sent it to me last night, the video of the weekend, and that picture of planting those onions, picture of planting some potatoes. Whenever I saw that in the video, I was like, hmm, thanks JT, you gave me a perfect illustration. We had a bunch of students go out to several places yesterday. One of them was the community center, part of Living Bridges. And we planted some things. Now, are we going to see those things grow? Probably not. We might go out there like in a couple months and maybe they're big, but maybe some of those students will never go back out there again. But there's people in that community that come to that garden and they take those things and they use them. They need them. And so maybe you're just called to plant a few seeds here and there. Or maybe you're also called to cultivate those things, to help them grow, to help them be nourished and find truth and freedom. And so I know my message was longer than usual, but I pray it was a message of hope, a message of freedom, a message of salvation that every one of us needs. And if it wasn't for you, man, it was for me this morning because I needed this after a long weekend, but knowing God still sustains me as well as that coffee this morning, right? (laughs) But it's all God's doing. Our lives are a living example of our faith. If we value something more than God, more than loving what God loves, we're gonna show that to the people around us. And so what are you valuing in your life? As you leave today, I want you to know that you're freed from your sins. You're freed from unrealistic pressures, some realistic pressures too. But I wanna ask you, are you resting and trusting in the sufficiency of Jesus this morning? And then are you also sharing with others that they can find rest, they can find hope, they can find peace, they can find their Savior.